Okay, uh, welcome everyone um, for the OAuth interim meeting. So this is the not well, um, as a reminder, this applies here too. Um, so today we have two topics, the client intermediary metadata that Aaron will talk about and the multi-subject JOT that I will be um, talking about later on. Um, next week, Torsten will be talking about RAR. Um, and I still have to schedule a meeting for OAuth 2.1 to continue that discussion. So um, Aaron, would, would May 3rd work for you guys uh, and Dick? If not, you can let me know what what ta what date work for you guys. Looks like May third works for me. Okay. Dick, would that would that work for you? What did he say? Say yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, he said yes in the chat. Good. Okay. Awesome. Good. Uh, so that's it. Let me stop here and I'll give you a chance to share, uh, share, stop sharing. Go ahead. Okay, let me share the keynote window. All right. Um, yeah, sorry, getting my window in order. Okay. So, yeah, the client intermediary metadata, this is um, a draft I've been working on um, with some other, other folks. I'll mention them um, shortly, but I want to give a quick summary of uh, what the spec does, what the idea behind the spec is, and then talk about the use cases uh, for it as well. It is not a lot, there's not a lot going on here. It is basically extending the dynamic client registration spec to provide additional information about additional parties involved in an OAuth transaction. So this is basically all it's adding. It's adding a section called intermediaries to that registration request, describing um, a list of additional parties, whether that's going to be a company of some sort um, that would get access to data after the OAuth um, flow is complete, that'll be accessing that data in some way. Um, the other end of this is that the authorization server is expected to actually display this on the consent screen as well. So where we have, normally we would have um, the consent screen show just the client ID of the application that's getting access to someone's data we we need to also be able to list out additional parties that would be getting that access as well. So that's the mechanism. Again, it's not a very complicated addition to the spec, but I wanna talk about some of the motivation for having this uh, in the first place. So in the traditional OAuth model, the OAuth client is the one that's getting registered at the, at the authorization server, uh, it's getting the client ID, possibly a client secret, and that's uh, used in the consent process as well as for the authorization server to make internal policy decisions um, about token lifetimes or whatever it is. That is, um, that's a traditional model. In the financial world, what ends up happening is you have an app like uh, a budget tracker app or your, um, your tax software or your accounting software that's going to go and pull transaction data from multiple different banks. Now, each of those banks, of course, would have their own authorization server. So we have this one client uh, talking to many different APIs. And in practice, what's ended up happening is that these applications actually don't talk to each bank's API directly. They actually go through these uh, this new sort of layer of of infrastructure, these aggregator APIs. And those aggregator, aggregator APIs will end up with the, the actual contract and the relationship with the banking APIs um, 
And that layer is the only one that the team APIs actually know about. And then the application will go and register at the aggregator to get credentials to talk to all the different banks. So in practice, it ends up looking like this. We've got a whole bunch of different applications talking to different aggregators that all talk to different banks. So the question then here is, what is the client ID? And how does that involve, how does that influence the, the consent process? So uh, is it the, is it the application the end user is using? Is it the aggregator? Is it some combination of, of the chain? And why this starts to involve actually uh, needing a spec around it is, you know, the banks do want to ensure that the user has is informed and has agreed to share their data with the application as well as any of the intermediary companies that are processing that data. So the idea with the um, the idea with the client intermediary metadata spec is that the dynamic client registration request establishes the whole chain of um, of entities. So it, it establishes the the application the name that the end user is using and as well as the list of intermediaries that will have access to that user's data when they are using this application. So this work has been actually going on for a while. Um, I, I brought this up last year after the, after doing the first iteration of it. Um, since that draft, it's actually been uh, simplified a bit and um, really minor changes, but overall simpler and um, it is being used in the financial data, data exchange, which is a, um, it's the, it's a nonprofit organization around, you know, dealing with financial APIs and it's got a whole bunch of U S and Canada based institutions that are adopting these, uh, that are trying to, you know, now adopt OAuth for the financial industry. So, um, this group. This is a group I've been working with, and you know they're taking OAuth and now FAPI as well um, as the foundation for the the financial a APIs and adding their own customizations and extensions where needed. So this is one of the um, one of the pieces that fits into the puzzle of what FDX is doing, and um, wanted to bring this up to the group because I I felt like this problem that um, of, of establishing these additional parties is not actually unique to the financial space. And that's the reason I thought it was relevant to bring up here, because otherwise, if it was, if it's, if it's extensions that are only going to be relevant to the financial industry, fine, you know, FDX can can go and create an extension on their own. But the, uh, I felt like this Idea, this concept of these intermediaries would apply to industries other than the financial industry. So that is why I'm bringing it here to the group. So um, that's really the background I have uh, on this. Happy to take any questions. Um, otherwise I would, uh, yeah, love to, to um, talk, about, talk about adopting this in our group here. Okay, Torsten. We can't hear you, Thorsten, if you're speaking. Yeah, yeah. Um, so thanks, Aaron. Um, Thorstenyes.com, um, ThorstenLodgeTest.com. I'm forgetting I'm standing in a queue in an ITF meeting. Um, can, you, can you go back, please, to the overview chart showing the aggregators and the clients? Yes. Thank you. So, um, I'm assuming that the application would still be the ultimate client and have the client ID and the aggregator the aggregators or the intermediaries would then be listed in the client's metadata. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the end user wants to see the name of the app they're using as the primary thing on the consent screen. So budget bunny in this example, um, mm -hmm. or whatever their, uh, yeah, whatever that app is. And then the, uh, the intermediaries would be the just, you know, fine print of who's processing this data. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this is, this is not a new problem and I don't think that's, that's unique to FTX or even the financial sector. Because uh, a lot of companies use 
other services uh, in providing their services. But what typically happens if you can go to the content screen again, what typically happens, uh, you've got a policy, privacy policy for, for example, budget bunny, and that policy would typically list all the intermediaries that are used in processing the data. So, I mean, from my perspective, this is a legal problem and not a technical. Because typically you've got one ultimate uh, uh, party that, that, that is the, I think on the GDPR it's called the data controller. So the ultimate responsible party. And there are other, other parties that, that contribute to that process. But typically what you do is you sign a data processing agreement with those. And then you take them into your policy um, document. So the user can inspect and, and, and review the document and can decide whether this is okay. So my question is, why do we need uh, this, this data at all in the, in the user consent process if that can be handled in the policy? And that's the way we do it today, for example, in our ecosystem. Uh, yeah, that is, that is a fair question. Um, let me, if, if uh, I see some people on the call here, if Don or Neil don't mind me calling on them, um, they are uh they are here from fdx on this call um i'd love to hear from them on the reasons for this being surfaced sure there's a couple layer. reasons a uh, couple reasons why uh, part of it's you know pending privacy oh, sorry, don, legislation can you introduce, can you introduce oh, your, hey your i'm yourself. don cardinal managing director of financial data exchange thanks part of it has to do with in north america federal state and provincial privacy regs coming out it's not just enough to disclose the chain at the app at uh, th that level, but remember we're handing this session all the way through and every party in the chain needs to see the chain end to end because God forbid you have a breach or some other thing, you wanna know what the other nodes in the chain, plus when you disclose at the data source, the bank or the brokerage, being able to say, hey, you just got a request from Budget Bunny through Alligator it's very important so the end user is fully consented to not just the data elements but the chain used to get there it's uh again full transparency end to end plus it supports fraud use cases um I'll, that's primarily why we're wanting to do that we, we feel that kind of transparency is the right thing to do and all this really does is standardizes it uh, you can choose to display or not display what your whatever legal does but this standardizes it so we can scale the sucker and uh, this is Anil Mahala, also uh, part of FTX. I work for Koya. Uh, we run a few uh, co-chair, a few committees in, and uh, working groups in uh, FTX. Torsten, uh, uh, so uh, as you're familiar, right, the client in this case does not have a relationship with the data provider at all. Only the aggregator does, right? So there is no uh, bilateral that is being signed offline uh, to keep that in check. So um the reason for this is to have transparency yes the client id is being provided to budget bunny in this case but the aggregator is the mediator who has the relationship with the provider and therefore the provider would get full visibility into where all the data is going and in addition to that a budget bunnies end user would then when they are on the provider uh, can also be the provider can also show them uh, where they are coming from uh, and, and make sure that uh, they understand uh, where all the data is going. Um, so that's why we wanted to um, have this uh, intermediary chain in place. Would that would mean that Alligator has the direct relationship, the contractual relationship with the data provider in that example? Typically, yeah. So typically, this is Don again. Typically, Budget Bunny or Don's budgeting app has no relationship with any of the bank or brokerages or insurance companies. Instead, they rely on a, a Plaid or a Mint or a Plaid or a Finicity to have or an Akoya to have thousands of relationships. Then the question directly pops up: um, How does Box Bunny is able, or how how does it? work in the end. I mean, Aaron just pointed out or explained that the client ID, the ultimate client ID is, is, is assigned to Bucks Bunny. That's the only chance that uh, the data provider 
is able to determine, okay, this is the client ID, this is Bugs Bunny, or this is Budget Bunny, I'm gonna show a user consent screen for Budget Bunny, it's not, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I, I, I don't understand how this is gonna work from a technical perspective. If, if Alligator okay. has the contract, then Alligator would need to have, it, or would have the client ID. Uh, so Budget Bunny basically would be unable to even start an OAuth dialog with the data provider. So I'm, I'm confused. Yeah, I can explain, Aaron, if you want. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so the client ID that is issued is is held by the aggregator. Uh, in the previous slide, the Bugs Bunny does not get that client ID or secret. Um, uh, it is it is issued to the aggregator on behalf of Bugs Bunny, and the relationship is between the aggregator and the data provider, uh, and and therefore um, that's how the OAuth is initiated. And that's the reason why when you uh, brought up privacy and you know the bilateral Bugs Bunny uh, Budget Bunny is not even in the picture uh, with these uh, you know the bilateral agreements that that are in place. Now, this may be unique to the financial industry, but uh, that's how it's set up. I haven't fully understood, so I can't really assess whether this is unique, but uh, according to what you said now, I, I would assume uh, Alligator would be the ultimate client. So a normal OAuth authorization server so would display Alligator in the in the top line of the of the user content screen and alligator would would authenticate towards the data provider which means in the end alligator would be the client and that would also mean that if the information that the ultimate rp is or the ultimate client is budget money then we would need to turn it around so the alligator would be the client that is registered with the data provider and the information that it is using or is is acting on behalf of budget money would be additional metadata Aaron, yeah, am, I is, completely, am I completely wrong? No, that's uh, that's you, you're right. But doing it that way ends up um, that's actually closer to how we had it, and in, in the first draft of this, with an additional concept of the end user application, which uh, was more along those lines of the this intermediary alligator being the primary entity register the data provider and then adding an extension to display the brand name and one of the one of the iterations we went through was let's reduce the number of things being added here and instead make the client name property in the registration request the user recognizable name adding only the uh, intermediary information into the into the chain Okay, then, then, that, then one last uh, statement, and I will leave the, the, the leave the queue to other people. So that that means ultimately that for every application using the aggregator, you would need to set up a client ID with the data provider, kind of as a, yes. of a multi-tenant or multi-tenancy concept. Yes. Yeah. And in the end, alligator would then authenticate on behalf of Budget Bunny and all the other applications. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Exactly. Okay, Justin. Uh, yeah, I was actually jumping on to uh, to make a similar observation. This effectively is uh, utilizing um, dynamic registration to register not a single client in the way that we tend to think about it in OAuth usually, but uh, where a client is representative of a particular instantiation of that chain. Right. And so if the budget bunny talks to a different aggregator, it would necessitate a whole new registration and a whole new chain. Um, so uh, my question to the presenters and apologies, I haven't uh, had a chance to reread this recently. Um, are there any considerations given to uh, authenticating the average the aggregator during its registration request um this is something that um as you know dynamic yeah. registration allows but leaves very very wide open to interpretation and that's yeah so yeah. the yeah for sure the um this draft doesn't talk about it at all because it is similarly not really relevant to the concept of intermediaries the ap specific application of the collection of these OAuth documents, this being one of them, 
that's being done in the FDX group, that spec, which is an FDX spec, lists out all those additional requirements of here's how this registration request is authenticated. Here's how these entities are going to set up these relationships. But that part, I didn't feel like was relevant to the rest of the, uh, the rest of the industry, because it is something that is specific to how it's being applied there. Dennis. Yes, I appreciate yeah. the explanation about the aggregator. However, in the specification, this term is missing. So uh, I'm a little bit puzzled. And also I look to my favorite section and there is no text in the privacy consideration section. And I would guess that there is some privacy concern to what the aggregator can see, can know, and uh, what the banks can see, can know, and so on. Don't you think so? The whole goal of this is to, the whole goal of the spec is to provide additional information about users' privacy to users, making it visible at a higher level in the chain uh, in an OAuth flow. So, I. Uh, Yes, I, we should probably add a privacy consideration section, but it's going to basically uh, say that it is the whole goal of this is to allow users to see who is getting access to their data. Um, okay, Justin. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to follow up with uh, with that notion about privacy, both the privacy and security of this, as it's been described so far, uh, seem to um, assume good intentions on behalf of uh, the various parties. And uh, I think if this spec is going to go forward, it's going to need some very serious. Uh, discussion about what happens when an aggregator lies about the client that it's representing or a client tries to lie about being part of an aggregator or any of these various chains right says so this is this is all well and good if you can actually trust that the registration that took place uh actually references the um the the parties that are being identified Right, and I, and so this this is part of what I was getting back to, uh, the last point that I tried to make about, um, you know, it's sort of when you allow registration, where that trust root really comes from, and uh, I think that, um, to me, that that really sits at the root of the uh, potential privacy and uh, security considerations you'd have here. Uh, that's a great point, and I think, uh, un unfortunately, like mo like many things in the OAuth world, it is uh, it is out of out of band information that gets where that 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 stuff gets locked down and, and uh, takes place. But I agree that it's worth pointing it out specifically in in a section in the draft of um, uh, of the fact that. Whoever is off doing the authenticated registration call is the one that is being trusted to provide the information, um, and the, that information is only as valid as the as that registration request authentication was. Right, exactly. Even if the information is coming out of band, it uh, it needs to be spelled out. Now, I'm I'm not faulting you for not having that laid out in an, in an ID. Kevin knows that's the last section I tend to write um, and in any detail in uh, specs that I've worked on as well. So I get that, but this is going to be really important because for this spec in particular, um, because this is changing the, um, it's not changing, but it's challenging the assumptions that uh, OAuth makes uh, in terms of uh, the understanding of what a client ID means. Okay, um, 
Thorsten. Yeah, along the same lines. I mean, in the end, um, I'm, I'm starting to understand that in the end, the data provider or the IAS um, relies on the on the aggregator um, regarding the identity of the application that um, it acts on behalf of. But, I mean, that reminds me on use cases that we also have in the PC2 world, um, where a, an, an aggregator is used to, to initiate a payment on behalf of a merchant. And uh, I mean, basically, the, in, in, in PSD2, there is no way to use dynamic client registration to, to implement that scenario. Um, instead, I would, uh, because there are uh, very expensive and uh, complicated to obtain uh, EIDA certificate involved in the, in the client authentication. And I, I would assume that I would uh, like to, or would try to solve that problem using uh, trans transaction specific parameters just to inform the, the consent flow. So I am, I am aggregator, alligator corp. And now I'm acting on behalf of budget money. So, uh, could you envision to solve that problem also on a transaction basis? I mean, I think dynamic registration is just one way to solve it. Um, but since there is anyway a trust relationship between the aggregator and the data provider, those data could come with every authorization request, basically. That is an interesting point. I don't think we've talked about that with the FDX group. Um, I, I could bring it up uh, in the in the API group, but that would be a much bigger change compared to what they are currently planning on on doing there. Yeah, but it's easier to implement. I mean, that's 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 the reason why I'm bringing it up. Relying on client registration for implementing that is is a really strong assumption. I know that there's a lot of thought being done to keeping track of the um, of the trust chains and and uh, for auditing and things like that. So we would have to go back to the list of those use cases in order to see if doing it at runtime would. Yeah, I mean, from my from my, from my from my experience in regulated environments, you will need to anyway keep track of those interactions on a per transaction basis. Because in the end, if you if you're seeing a dispute or a, a something like that, you will need to have an audit or a trail of of a, of a, of a um, specific transaction, not just a static, uh, uh, how to say, uh, image of, of what's what what's happened with a certain client. So I think I, I would I would uh, tie that to the grant to the particular grant, for example, refresh token or access token. But just just an idea, right? Just thinking aloud. Well, this is Anil, if I could yep. chime in, yes, FTX is looking into the consent API person um, to see how we can provide consent information, what data clusters the, the end user is agreeing to, the time frame. We have also looked into the RAR uh, to see if that might be a way, but we are definitely looking at the fine-grained consent on and on, uh, on with every authorization that would have to be uh you know uh or played on the on the bunny bud, budget bunny side and then replayed on the data provider side so uh then it could be recorded um but yes we are looking into that but this one uh for intermediary is just laying down the rails uh for registration uh, and then all of the consent is going to write on those rails uh, to make sure yep this is the client this is the intermediary we have actually gone further into the ftx one where we have uh, sub intermediaries as well. Uh, but this was just only during registration. Once the registration is done, there's a lot more going on for authentication authorization. Okay, uh, Dick. Not sure many people know how Plaid and others work today, but they don't use OAuth at all, right? The, user is typing in the credentials for their financial institution into the app in a window that Plaid puts up. So Plaid gets the you know, username, password directly of your financial institution, takes that, calls the bank, gets back uh, something and manages all. So there's, there's really, we're, in these applications are actually teaching users it's okay to go and just type your credentials directly into an app, something that we were trying to solve with OAuth way back at the very beginning. Um, so in some ways, this is a step in the right direction, but it, the, you guys are talking about issues here that 
are a long ways away from what's actually happening in practice out there in the world. I should have, I should have started, I should have opened with that. Sorry. Uh, the whole goal of any of this work being done in FTX is to exactly stop that behavior of let's stop users entering credentials. We need a solution to it. Well, if there's a, it turns out there is a solution. It's OAuth. It's been around for a while. I don't know if you've heard about it and let's see if we can actually get banks to adopt it. So that is, that is the work that's going on in, in FTX right now. Yeah. So the pushback uh, arm that Plaid has provided and has argued in you know, a number of uh, their discussions with regulators is that apps don't want to have to do the redirect. And so, you know, it's a cleaner experience and a simpler experience. And of course, the app people are happy to do that and stuff like that. So while I think we can argue about the OAuth, uh, I think it's actually going to be get driven more in a regulatory framework as opposed to, oh, this technology is available because the technology has been available to do, do the redirect and they opted not to do that because they didn't like the experience that was being delivered. Well, yes, yeah, you know, that... a lot of the banks didn't support an OAuth flow to begin with, so it wasn't always an option. Yeah, now we've got 12 and that number is going to go up a lot bigger million consumers in North America. That's why FDX has almost 200 member organizations. That's the difference. Uh, what's the heck? What's the use of a spec if no one can support it? So we're seeing a lot more enabled endpoints. You see firms like Akoya um, and we do have Plaid on record saying, hey, they want to move 75% of their traffic to API by end of this year. So we're finally getting them on a record along with the other aggregators. But you're right, Dick, that it's screen scraping has been around for 25 years. It's going to be a long tail. Okay, anybody else has any comments, questions? Aaron, do, do you still have uh, some slides to share or is it, was that? The last That's one? it for me. Okay. Um, so, so like, what are you looking for, Aaron, right now? Are, are you, are you expecting that, like, are you, are you looking for the work group? To decide if they want to adopt it right now, or is it like what? What's the? Yeah, I guess the um, the so FDX is moving forward with this with this work. You know, they're progressing with their own compiling various building blocks. Um, so it sounds like uh, we yeah. I as far as my immediate feedback or the task on this, I definitely will. Um, work on adding a privacy consideration section to this, but assuming that that exists, my question to the group is more, is this something that other people would benefit from being a IETF standard? Um, is there interest here in, in continuing that work there? Um, otherwise, if it's something that is specific to just the financial space, which I don't think it is, but, you know, we can always just have it be just an just an FDX extension of OAuth. Okay, um, Justin. Yeah, just real quick to the FDX folks. Um, if this work is picked up by the OAuth working group, and the OAuth working group decides to uh, slice it into tiny pieces, chop it up, uh, put some ribbons on it, and then uh, publish it as something that's almost unrecognizable, which, as we all know. We're that's, that's what we do. Yeah. Um, it went, if slash when that happens, um, what is what is FDX's plan for um, for following that kind of work? Uh, like, is is there actually a formal engagement plan for following an, um, a standard through its development cycle? Um. So I don't know what I'm. Uh, I'm not familiar with how ITF uh, works. So if you want to chop it up and it's minced meat, we'll have to see if we can still make a burger out of it. So I'm not exactly sure. It's a hypothetical question, uh, but I'll let you know if, uh, if if this goes through, which we have been working on quite a bit, uh, we can uh, you know uh, as you you know break it up, we can have conversations then and what you plan on doing. Well, I guess so the question, that... Anil, is. Um, if okay. you know if there's changes breaking changes as it goes through the process 
uh, is you know is FDX willing to uh, incorporate those back into the into the FDX work? We're willing to keep uh, a very open mind uh, as long as it's fit for purpose. Uh, we don't have a lot built on it yet, but we are planning on building two. What version three's got out here? Um, that being said, you know the, the market need for this for a white pages, a yellow pages, if you will, and that transparency for privacy stuff. Um, to yeah, we certainly want to where we can reuse IETF, FIDO, W3C, NIST, you know, FAPI. We don't want to reinvent the wheel, but to the, to the extent we can support it, we absolutely do want to. If it's when you say breaking, that makes me nervous. There's there's breaking and then there's broken. Yeah. So so just, just sorry, breaking change is a is a spec term that means uh, a change that like. You change the property name, it's technically a breaking change because any code that was written to the previous draft no longer works. Right. Granted, we can deal with that, whether we have a legacy term or historical versions 5.0 or higher, we can deal with that. It's now called this. We can make it port stuff like that backward portable. That's not an issue. If it becomes where the business purpose, the regulatory purpose behind it isn't usable, that's an issue. But as long as it's fit for purpose, I think arose uh, by any other name, we can make that work. Right. Yep. Yeah, so the uh, I phrased my question a bit glib and I apologize for that, but the um, the reason I'm asking is that because this is an external group that you guys have, you know, requirements to ship something and that absolutely makes sense. Um, there is no guarantee bringing something into a standards organization that it's going to look like what you brought in the door once it leaves again. And, um, and that's often a difficult, uh, a difficult thing to balance. Um, that said, people do balance this kind of, uh, situation all the time. Um, I, the ITF is made up of companies that bring existing technology into the group and then, you know, work with it and, um, uh, and tweak things as, as it changes and the specific, um, a, a specific precedent you might be interested in is when Open Banking UK first got aligned with the FAPI working group. Uh, originally, OB UK had a, had a lot of just bespoke stuff that they just kind of patched together to solve the problem in kind of a weird way. Um, and then now the OB UK, several years down the line, um, is, uh, is aligned with FAPI uh, explicitly. But a lot of that came from the open banking folks engaging with the FAPI working group saying, hey, here's what we're doing. And the FAPI working group saying, okay, that's great, but let's make a way that that works for more than just open banking. Right. Yeah, yeah I think what I'm getting out of is, uh, this is that we have to, if we come, if we are okay with this, then we have to commit to participate in, in future conversations as things are being shaped so that we can ask the right questions and make sure that it is backwards compatible. And if not, that there's a plan for us to inform our members uh, that a breaking change is going to come and here are the reasons why it's breaking. Okay, um, two more minutes, uh, Aaron. So just, you wanna wrap it up? Yeah, I don't have anything else to add. Um... Okay. So, uh, so, yeah, I guess, I guess. Try again. You froze a little bit. Sorry. I don't, um, I don't have anything else to add here, but I also don't know exactly what to do for the next step. Yeah. So it seems that that like, as, as Justin mentioned, like this, like when you go through that the whole process of the idea this could completely change right and it could could be the the, the change could be dramatic right and 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 you guys have to uh, understand that that could happen right so it's uh, it is something that happens all the time at the itf right so um maybe quickly i i want to ask that the team the the group here it's a small list of people but i just want to get the feeling of of the team here, um, um, it, are people interested in working on this problem here at the at the OAuth work group? If you are in favor of kind of, and and I'm not calling for adoption right now. I'm just want to get the feeling of that of the group here. Uh, if you are in favor of kind of working on such such a problem, can you please um, uh, indicate that uh, in the chat there?
Okay, I, I don't see anybody um, chiming in here. So, uh, so let's let's do this, Aaron. So I think we we need to probably continue that discussion on the on the mailing list, um, and and see if we can get more people kind of excited about this and interested in this, um, and and take it from there. Like if if we need to later schedule another meeting for this, that, that will be fine. But uh, let's continue that discussion on the mailing list, right? Yep, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's switch gears. Okay. From this one. Slide here. Okay, share application. Okay, can you see my slides? Looks good. Yep. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, okay, so um, I'd like to talk about that uh, multi-subject um, JOT. So the, the JOT document defines the concept of a nested JOT where one JOT contains another JOT. And the initial draft had a narrow scope in mind, which is to try to allow the enclosing JOT the document uh, the enclosing JOT to have its own claims, which is not defined in the JOT document today. Uh, since then, and based on feedback from the work group and many others uh, offline, the scope is, in, is now a little bit uh, wider. So the, uh, there are a number of use cases that require the token to include multiple subjects. Uh, the goal of this document is to define a JOT that can represent those uh, multiple subjects and a relation, uh, the relationship between these these subjects, using that the nested uh, JOT concept. Um, so, the, and there are a number of use cases. Uh, I'll walk you through a few of those use cases. So, uh, the first use case is for a primary subject with a secondary subject that has authority over the primary subject. An example is a child parent. A pet owner, right? So, and if we look at a, an, a, an example, for example, a, a, a pharmacy example, in this case, the, the AS would have the details of this subject and would allow the secondary subject, which is the parent in this case, for example, to request medications for the primary subject, which, which is the, the child. Another example is uh, the second example um, uh, is. Um, uh, where you have two uh, uh, primary subjects. Uh, an example is a married couple, right? If we continue that uh, pharmacy example, um, in this case, the AS would be set up to provide one subject with permission to access the other subject resources. Um, a, a third um, use case that delegation authority is that, uh, in this case, the primary subject delegates authority over a resource to a secondary subject who acts on behalf of that primary subject. An example is a, a user, a, an admin relationship. Uh, the, the, uh, like a, a fourth use case is um, what we call, what I'm calling it replaced uh, primary subject. And there are two different use cases. Uh, one is, um, is uh, uh, first example is used by STIR, which is a telephony use case where A calls B, uh, but the, the call gets redirected to C. The redirection service needs to provide C with the details of the call, including the original call number or person B. Um, the second example of, of, uh, of this is um, um, the N N NSM uh, project, uh, which is a mechanism that maps the, the service mesh concept in Kubernetes to layer two and layer three uh, payloads. Um, uh, in this case, messages pass through multiple intermediaries and each intermediary will create a new token 
to pass to the next interme intermediary, but include the original token. So these are the, the number of kind of use cases that would require or need such a such a, a, a jot or concept, right? So in this case, um, what I'm suggesting here is they define a new claim. In this case, I'm calling it R sub or for related subject to hold the secondary subject and its relationship to, to the primary subject. Um, I'm showing an example here. So you have a subject, obviously, a typical subject, which is stays the same, a, a, an R subject, which is a related subject, which has um, two um, uh, claims, one relationship or rel uh, for relationship and jot for the, the, the enclosed jot uh, that would be carried uh, in, in this, uh, in this, uh, in this jot, right? So, so that, that's what, what I, um, I have in mind. Uh, multiple use cases seems that, that to need this. And I was uh, interested to hear from the work group what they, what they have to say about this, if there is interest, if there are any comments, questions about this. Any questions? No questions? So this is Mike Jones. Could you go back and tell us more about how you're representing the relationship? Yeah, in this case, I'm I'm, I'm just using a, a specific URN here to, to talk about the relationship between um, the, um, the related subject and the primary subjects, right? I mean, partly I would have expected the JSON syntax to be an array, not the vertical bar thing. It an array for multiple of those. I, I like I was. Uh, I'm talking about one kind of relationship between whatever in in this jot and this subject, right? So why would you why would you need an array? Well, but you have authority, primary, actor, and original, and yet those different URNs are not in an array syntax. They're in, I think, a string syntax, but... Yeah, so, so maybe, like, I'm not suggesting that all of them will be at the same time, so you have to choose one of those, right? Maybe the syntax is not the... Like, uh, at, at least at this stage, I'm just talking uh, at the concept level, whether that syntax is, is exactly like this or something else, I, I don't have a strong opinion. But, but in, my, in my mind, what I have in mind in this case, you will have either authority, for example, to indicate the relationship between this subject and the primary subject or primary or act or whatever, right? Mike, he's saying that it's one of those, and the bar is. Yeah, your... I get that. That, that yeah. wasn't clear from the slide. I thought he okay. was saying it was all of those. No, no, it's it's one of those. Yes, that that. So maybe I'm I wasn't clear. Yes. Any other comments, questions? Okay. Uh, are, do people think that this is? Um, a useful thing to work on? Like, is that something that would be in interest to people in, in here? And I'm asking as a person here, like a, a contributor, not a chair. How did STIR solve this for themselves? So, um, STIR... Um, I believe they included a specific um, a specific um, um, a claim. I think they, they called it um, a original, right? But the, uh, yes, but, yeah. But they did not. I don't think they they provided any relationship because it's one kind of use case. While 
there are, as you can see, there are multiple of use, use cases. So uh, what I'm trying to do is kind of make it more generic that you could include um, the, the, the relationship between the primary and the secondary job, right? The subject, right? And and by the way, I'm I'm like I'm like we can work on the details if we're gonna tweak it and change the the structure here. That that's fine. It's just I'm, I'm trying to understand if people are interested in the problem and, and try to solve this problem, right? What I'm struggling with is whether there's enough in common between the different use cases that it makes sense to have a standard syntax for this, or rather the like the stir case that the particulars will vary. And so each use case could de define and register its own claims. And I don't have an opinion on that one way or the other, but I think that's an important question. Right. Okay. So Rifat, at the in the interest of keeping objectivity, since you're wearing your working group chair hat, plus yeah. you're trying to kind of do this pitch as well, and Hannes isn't here, yeah. uh, I, I think we have this a little bit of the same situation as we had in the previous conversation that w we need to go back to the to the list here and better describe the dimensionality of of what uh, what's good, what's what's being kind of pitched here to uh, to accomplish to see what the next step might be. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, Stop shit here. Okay. Uh, okay. I think that's that's all we have then for today. Uh, just before you guys go, make sure to, if you haven't uh, added your name to the list, let me paste it again for people that haven't uh, added their name. Please add your name to to the to the link there, and. Um, I think that's all we're done here. Any any questions, comments from anybody before we drop here? Okay. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Bye. See you later. Bye.